Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Carrie Burke, your moderator for today's webinar, an updated take, threat modeling for IoT systems. You may send in questions at any time during the presentation via the chat feature. We will collect these and address them at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Dan Cornell, a globally recognized application security expert who holds over 15 years of experience architecting, developing, and securing web-based software systems. As Chief Technology Officer and Principal at Denim Group, he leads the technology team to help Fortune 500 companies and government organizations integrate security throughout the development process. All right, thank you, Kerry. Uh, thank, uh, thanks to all of y'all uh, who are taking the time to attend today. I hope everybody out there is uh, healthy and safe. Uh, I, I guess the real question uh, is, in this new work from home world, how many of y'all out there are wearing pants? Hopefully, hopefully everybody made it, uh, you know, made it to the point where they got pants on today. Uh, so today we're gonna be talking about threat modeling for IoT systems. Um, just a little bit of a background on myself. Uh, my name is Dan Cornell. I'm one of the founders of and the CTO of Denim Group, uh, and I'm a software developer by background. Um, you know, originally did a lot of uh, server-side Java in the uh, mid to late 90s, uh, then did some early .NET stuff in the 2000s, but really what I've focused on for probably the last 15 or so years of my career is the impact of software developers on the security of the organizations using their products. Uh, so helping organizations more reliably build secure software. Uh, but my background as a developer, I think it's been helpful as we've started to look at IoT systems because uh, again, as a systems designer and a systems developer by background, uh, that has helped me to understand the threat models and the structure of these IoT systems, uh, which can be quite complicated. Uh, a little background on Denim Group, again, we do uh, software and application security work, both uh, professional and managed services, uh, as well as helping organizations with our ThreadFix platform. Uh, so uh, one amusing story, uh, I, was, I was talking with one of my business partners uh, around last Christmas and he was watching his neighbor's house for them just uh, you know, across the street keeping an eye out uh, and he noticed someone uh, on their porch with a bunch of packages and uh, you know, thought something was being delivered or whatever, walked out to, to say hi, uh, noticed that the guy was wearing a full-on ski mask and had a knife uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, so quickly retreated. Uh, as it turned out, the neighbor's uh, ring camera caught the entire interaction uh, you know, of the guy coming up with the ski mask, turning around, you know, taking the ski mask off uh, you know, as he approached and whatnot. So uh, uh, thankfully, no one got hurt. Uh, they managed to keep all of their gifts. Uh, I guess this guy was stealing gifts. Uh, but uh, I, I thought it was amusing, probably not uh, not as amusing. or I, I probably thought it was more amusing uh, than uh, my business partner did, uh, but that uh, you know, him getting uh, stabbed could have almost been on a, a ring camera. Uh, and, and if that's not a great uh, you know, case for, uh, you know, for the utility of IoT devices, I don't know what is. Uh, so the agenda for today, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Internet of Things uh, and an overview and, and my perspective of uh, you know, how those technologies can be looked at. Um, and that, again, comes from a perspective that we have at Denim Group and the types of work that we do. And so I want to outline that because uh, that, I think, helps to inform uh, you know, where my perspective comes from, the value of that, as well as potential holes in that perspective. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the goals of threat modeling. You know, why, why is threat modeling a practice that is valuable? Uh, and then we'll move into looking at specifically why is threat modeling especially valuable when you're looking at the Internet of Things. Uh, I'll provide a quick overview of uh, the process of threat modeling or a process for threat modeling. Uh, if people are interested in more information about that, we could potentially do a follow-up session. Uh, we don't have time today to get really deep into the practices of threat modeling, but that's certainly something that we could follow up with. Uh, I'll talk about some specific things that we've found uh, to be important when you are threat modeling Internet of Things or IoT systems, uh, and then we'll have uh, time at the end for some questions. Uh, so the Internet of Things, uh, you know, Internet of Things is 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 cool. 
right? Uh, there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on in this area. And, and also in looking at these, uh, you know, in looking at these logos, what I, what I learned is that apparently if you're an IOT company, you can only use about three colors in your logo. That's all the options you have. Um, you know, but we, uh, you know, the internet of things is something that is really changing the face of people's lives uh, because these connected devices are now, you know, you're able to, to connect these devices and have them put together capabilities that you hadn't seen in the past. Uh, so really exciting things like cameras, things like personal assistants, um, you know, all kinds of really exciting stuff. Uh, and what we see is that when the press talks about the Internet of Things. The focus is really on consumer-focused Internet of Things. Again, those cameras, those personal assistants, and whatnot. Uh, we get a slightly different perspective just because of the work that we do at Denim Group, and I'll talk uh, and, and I'll talk through that. But uh, you know, if you look at the press focus, and especially if you look at discussions of IoT security, the focus is typically on consumer-oriented IoT. Um, but really, the bulk of the IoT market. Uh, and, and, and I would argue a lot of the, the bulk of the changes in the world are not just going to be consumer focused, but in the industrial adoption of IoT technologies. Um, you know, and, and, and I think when, you, when we look at the volume of, uh, you know, again, the volume of changes, uh, the consumer stuff is certainly going to have a tremendous impact. But as we see this get into enterprises, as we see it get into industry, uh, I think we'll see an even greater impact behind the scenes in those areas. Uh, and so here's some definitions that I you know, admittedly made up. Um, and again, this, this comes from my perspective on IoT systems based on the work that we do at Denim Group. And so when I think of IoT, I see consumer IoT. Uh, and these are the Internet of Things or IoT systems that are sold to the general populace, things like front door cameras, exercise trackers, personal assistants. Uh, and again, this is the exposure, the direct exposure that a lot of people have. Um, we also do a lot of work with enterprise IoT, and these. Then this is looking at businesses, typically larger enterprises, that are deploying IoT systems for some sort of a business gain. Uh, and a very common trend that we see is these are largely consumer-focused uh, technologies or items, but that are being deployed in enterprise environments. And this creates some challenges because, again, from a security standpoint, uh, from a privacy standpoint, there are certain things that the market enforces for consumers, uh, and those are not necessarily the same things that are needed or required if you take those same technologies and put them into an enterprise environment. I'll also talk about a little bit about industrial Internet of Things. Uh, and these are the more specialized systems that are sold in industrial environments. And so smart lighting, uh, these hyper-connected control systems, the industrial equipment uh, enhancements, and things of that nature. Uh, and again, I think that this is a lot of stuff that is behind the scenes. Again, you don't see as much about it in the press. Um, but if we look at the changing face of the world, um, you know, I think these, have, uh, th these are going to have a tremendous impact on the world uh, in ways that a lot of folks don't necessarily notice. Um, so why are we concerned about, uh, you know, why, why is in a, a particular class of stakeholder interested in IoT security? Uh, so if you're a consumer, right, if you're just a you know, John Q. Public, you're out there, you're, you know, you're using IoT devices, you've got a question, is this safe, right? How is this going to impact on my privacy, on my finances? You know, that's typically the concern that we see from consumers. Um, when we look at enterprise and industry, their question is more, I'm deploying these IoT devices and these systems in my environment. How does this change my risk profile? Uh, we also do a lot of work with developers and, uh, you know, and, and, and the organizations that are building these systems. And, and the questions they typically have is or, or, or centered around, I'm building IoT systems. You know, what do I need to worry about? Um, and so I want to talk a little bit again about my perspective and, and, and my view. Uh, and so this, my view of the topic obviously is skewed by my experience, uh, and that is largely acting as a consultant uh, that helps organizations deal with the risks associated with IoT, right? So I, you know, other than being a consumer myself, I don't have, I haven't done a tremendous amount of thinking about the consumers uh, because consumers don't pay Denim Group because they don't have, I mean, they're, they're too poor. They don't have enough money. You know, if, if you're a, if you're, if you're going to buy a hundred dollar Fitbit, you're probably not going to come to us for a you know, five figure risk assessment before you buy that three figure, uh, low, super low three figure Fitbit, right? Uh, and so I don't have as much uh, experience 
working through the concerns of consumers, you know, but we do a lot of work with the people that sell things to consumers, right? And those are the types of organizations that work with us uh, in order to protect their brands uh, by protecting their customers. Um, because again, if when you see these articles about IoT security, uh, they are largely focused on consumer-oriented devices. Um, and you know, maybe it's true that there's no such thing as bad press, but if you're XYZ camera and you're found to have insecurities in your system, or if you're some fitness tracking device and you're found to have poor security in your system, that's gonna impact your brand. So we work with organizations who are saying, we're building these devices and systems for consumers. Um, you know, Help us uh, do better at security so that we can help avoid brand damage that may cause people not to buy the devices. You know, we also do a lot of work with enterprises. Uh, you know, they work with us to be safer when deploying IoT systems into their enterprise infrastructures. And so that is an area where we have a lot of experience with these consumer devices. Um, you know, but often from the standpoint of uh, you know, these, uh, these consumer devices being deployed in enterprise environments, Maybe that you know what security features do they have? Uh, you know, what capabilities do they have? Do those fit into the uh, you know, enterprise architecture, the security architecture of these large enterprises? You know, as I said, if you take consumer devices and try to put them into uh, you know enterprise environments, you end up with some interesting uh, you know issues that come along with that. Uh, we also work with industrial organizations saying we're deploying these IoT systems into these industrial environments, uh, you know, similar to enterprises, but typically these industrial organizations are deploying in, you know, systems or devices that are intended to be used in those industrial areas. Um, and so there are certainly security concerns, but they, uh, you know, at least the people building those devices anticipated the security concerns of the deployed environments uh, in a way that maybe they didn't, uh, you know, when you're looking at these consumer oriented technologies. Uh, we also do a lot of work with the system builders uh, to help them build safer IoT systems. Um, you know, and, and, and a lot of this, as with, with almost everything in security, it comes down to the question of incentives, right? Are, are there appropriate economic incentives in place that get firms to do the right thing from a security standpoint? Uh, you know, it's typically the organizations where they have incentives in line uh, driving them to want to build more secure devices and systems. Those are the organizations that come and work with us. Um, so again, from a consumer standpoint, some sophisticated consumers might, uh, you know, informally threat model IoT systems, but really as a consumer, you're just going to kind of get what you're going to get. You know, it's funny, I've had discussions with my wife, you know, hey, should we get one of these, you know, personal assistants? I'm like, you really want something sitting in our house listening to everything that we say? Uh, you know, and that's, and that's if, again, I, I suppose I'm a reasonably sophisticated consumer just because of my background. Um, but, uh, you know, th th that's the level of thinking that a lot of consumers uh, put into this and really a lot of them just rely on the brand to make trust decisions right is this something coming from a large technology firm that i know and trust okay good then i you know then i trust having that device in my life in my house uh is this from some firm that i don't know anything about you know, from overseas whatever that might be uh, i don't know that brand okay maybe i'm not going to take their device and use that as my fitness tracker or something along those lines um, you know, for enterprises and industry, this is largely a supply chain concern. They're not typically building their own systems. They're purchasing systems from others. And so we go in and uh, you know, work with these firms to say, if you're going to take these devices and put them in your environment, what are the security impacts? Uh, and so there, threat modeling can be used to identify potential risks, hopefully during the acquisition process. Again, this is something to do before you roll out these technologies, not something to do afterward. Uh, because uh, again, once you have these things deployed, you probably sign contracts, you're kind of stuck at that point and you may be limited in the type of testing and uh, you know, evaluation activities you can do after the fact. Um, so this is something to get in front of, um, you know, especially in these you know, enterprise environments, uh, you know, the time to think about this is before you've deployed these. Um, you know, once you've purchased an item, it's, it's kind of your problem. We've seen that in a number of cases where organizations purchase technology, start to deploy it, have security concerns and go back to the vendor and the vendor says, Bad news. I mean, we, here's the contract. You bought it. There's no, uh, you know, uh, you know, case that you can make or no, you know, straightforward legal path that you have, uh, you know, recourse for the security of these devices. So again, from a supply chain standpoint, you want to be earlier in the process rather than later. Uh, for developers looking at using threat modeling, you know, threat modeling is great to do during development to identify 
potentially huge security issues that are going to be really expensive to fix later and, and are potentially going to be embarrassing to have publicly revealed. Um, you know, when we look at the types of problems that uh, threat modeling finds, uh, you know, they tend to be the ones that are very expensive to fix. And also when you look at the deployment of systems, you know, it can be really hard or even impossible for you to force updates, right? So if you've got, you know, security issues in your protocols, security issues on devices where it's not easy or even possible for you to force updates, um, you know, you need to discover those issues early. Otherwise, it's exponentially harder or impossible to address those issues later. Um, you know, we also use threat modeling a lot to, uh, from a red teaming standpoint or from an adversarial standpoint, to target testing activities, um, and that and that allows us to have consistency as you know across the different systems that we look at. Um, and again, certain developers or certain organizations see security as a differentiator. You know, if they have discerning customers that care about this and that are concerned about this. Uh, so let's look at goals of threat modeling. You know, why do you threat model? And really, the three main reasons, there's two main reasons we see and an auxiliary reason um, you know, of, of why organizations do threat modeling. You know, the first is to avoid introducing vulnerabilities. Again, I talked a little bit before about how the types of vulnerabilities that you find with threat modeling uh, tend to be the ones that are expensive and challenging to address. Uh, so finding that stuff earlier is better. Uh, you know, we, uh, we also use threat modeling to identify vulnerabilities in an existing system, right? So if you're going to be, uh, you know, if, if we're going to be testing a system, a threat model helps for us to have a more standardized approach uh, and to have, again, consistency across engagements. Uh, another benefit of threat modeling is it helps you to understand systems. And so if you think about the different security activities you can undertake, if you do a, uh, a security test, well, that's a point in time view of the security of that system, right? And, and the output of that, if, you know, if, if it's a, a report or some set of uh, vulnerabilities, that's valuable, but that can be, you know, the value of those is uh, a little bit uh, ephemeral, right? Or at least more ephemeral. We see a lot more durable, uh, there's a lot more durability in the value of what comes out of threat modeling because it captures, here's what this system is doing, here's how the pieces fit together. Uh, and we see there's typically less drift over time uh, for, for, for the value of that or for the structure of that, you know, that drifts over time less than the individual vulnerabilities which can be introduced and, and corrected. Um, so again, uh, talking about avoiding introducing vulnerabilities, it's cheaper to identify vulnerabilities at the whiteboard than it is to fix them at the keyboard, especially when things have been deployed, um, and especially in these distributed and connected nature of these IoT systems. Uh, finding vulnerabilities, again, we use this as a way to have a structured view of systems, um, and it provides a lot of consistency uh, so that we have, you know, we know that we've looked at the various parts of the system at an, at a, at an agreed upon level of detail. Uh, and from an understanding, you know, what are the parts of the system? How do they fit together? Uh, you know, to essentially run analysis to say, well, if I change this piece over here, what is going to happen to that? Um, and these threat models, I think, encourage critical thinking and especially with developers because it can open up a, a different type of thinking for a lot of developers where they start to look at a systems level, uh, you know, both from a construction standpoint, but with threat modeling also from a testing standpoint. So why would we want to threat model IoT systems? Why is threat modeling particularly of value in uh, IoT systems? You know, and that, uh, you know, in, in the good old days, uh, you, know, you know, again, 15 years ago when I started looking at uh, application and software security, most of the systems were a lot simpler, right? You had users that are over there that are the bad guys. They're talking to some sort of a, you know, typically web application. That application sat on top of a database. And we knew, you know, here are the trust boundaries. Now, then we move into a mobile world. Well, all of a sudden, we've got the you know, stuff running on the server side, these enterprise web services, but we've also got mobile code that is running on a device that we don't control, right? And there may be other malicious applications running on that device, uh, you know, and a lot of mobile applications also rely on third-party web services, right? So if you look at the complexity of the system from, a, you know, in kind of an old-school monolithic web application moving to mobile, a lot more complicated, you know, and then when IoT, this gets even more complicated, right? It's kind of like taking, you know, you may have uh, all the 
things you had before from a mobile system because you've got a back-end web service, you've got a web-based uh, management interface, you've got a mobile management interface, but you've also got one or more types of IoT devices uh, running at different sites. You know, they obviously could use third-party web services. They may go through some sort of a gateway. Uh, and so what we've seen is this exponential increase in the complexity of systems. Uh, and threat modeling can be really valuable to bring that under control. Uh, and so one of the, like an interesting thing that I noticed um, or, or something that really brought home to me how the world changed was um, you know, we built uh, we've got links to all this stuff here uh, you know we built uh, when we started doing a lot of testing of mobile applications I took all of the uh, mobile application assessments that we done you know distilled those into a basic template mobile threat model, uh, and then look to see, hey, where do we find the vulnerabilities? What types of analysis was used to find it? Um, and this is, I presented this research at RSA, essentially saying, well, hey, let's look at, you know, real world mobile application assessments. What techniques find the most valuable uh, vulnerabilities, you know, to find from an insight standpoint? Uh, and, and, and then organizations could use this information in turn to say with my limited budget that I have for doing you know, running a mobile security program here are the testing areas and the testing techniques I'm going to prioritize so I tried to do that for the uh, you know, for, for IOT assessments you know, after we had gotten a certain volume of testing for IOT systems uh, I created this uh, initial sensible threat model based on kind of a consumer model uh, I started pulling in all of the statistics and I would find like oh okay well hey wait that this doesn't work so because this is being used in an enterprise case and so they've got like an LDAP server which you don't see in a consumer environment okay well, let's revise that uh, you know and then I you know, tried to fit some more stuff in and then ran into like oh well, here's this uh, you know, an industrial example that doesn't work either. Let's add something to the threat model. And what I found over time was that the uh, you know the, a so-called sensible threat model or a template threat model for IoT uh, you know didn't work. Uh, I just wasn't able to come together with something that uh, you know that, that was simple enough and globally applicable uh, as was as was possible in the mobile application case. Uh, and so that's when I realized that uh, you know even looking at the increase in complexity from web apps to mobile apps and the impact on threat modeling. Um, you know, that had become even more uh, challenging in an IoT environment. You know, so where does that leave us? You know, what we found is IoT environments are complicated. Uh, and again, because, uh, you know, and I think a lot of that stems from just saying an IoT, you know, Internet of Things environment, well, how is that difference between consumer, between enterprise, between industrial? Are we taking technologies from one area and trying to shoehorn them into another? Uh, so uh, these Internet of Things environments are complicated and potentially significantly more so than what, what most folks are used to. Um, and as a result, threat modeling for specific scenarios is even more valuable and more necessary than ever. And I would argue for you know, anything other than you know, trivial IoT environments, if you really want to be able to make assertions about the security in those environments, uh, if you really want to be able to you know, feel like you have a level of comfort or a level of competency about the security in those environments, uh, you have to have have a threat model. In the absence of one of those, uh, you know, there's really not a lot of basis for making any sort of sensible assertion about the security of an IoT system. Um, so we'll go through a really quickly a threat modeling environment or a threat modeling uh, activity. Uh, and again, this isn't something that we have a huge amount of time to dive into today. Uh, but if you're interested, let us know and we could potentially do, uh, you know, chunk up or simplify some of the uh, the threat modeling training that we run uh, th that we used to run as classroom training now we'll probably be running that as distance training uh, we may be able to uh, we, we can chop some of that up and uh, maybe run a, a couple sessions if, if folks are interested please let us know um, so from a threat modeling standpoint you need to disguise decide on your scope right what are the boundaries of the system that you want to do your threat model for uh, decide again what's in and out of scope um, Enumerate your assets and build out your data flow diagram. So understand what are all the pieces of the system? How do they talk to one another? Based on that, you can then enumerate the threats to the system. Uh, and we've got a fairly mechanical way that we can talk through to do this. Um, and then from that, you can decide on your mitigations. You know, how are we going to address? You know, we've, we've identified potential problems. How are we going to fix these? Uh, and the good news is, uh, or well, not only the good, good news for some development teams is doing nothing is always an option. Uh, but with threat modeling, it lets you explicitly decide to do nothing, um, which I would argue is better than doing nothing because you didn't know there was something to do. Um, so 
the first thing again to do is to create your data flow diagrams. And so like looking at the system, again, from the boundary standpoint, what are the external parts of the system that may be sending messages in or receiving messages, right? What are the different processes in your system that are doing different things? Where is data getting stored, right? Where does data go to rest in the system? Uh, and then looking at the data flows. How do all these pieces communicate with one another? Uh, it's also important to enumerate your trust boundaries, right? Where are the bad guys on one side and the good guys on another? Uh, because again, that's going to put you in a situation where you can ask the question of, well, am I validating the inputs that are coming across? Um, you know, where are, you know, where are the security issues likely to happen? Uh, so what you end up with is a diagram like this. Uh, so in this case, we've got a web application. You've got a user that's external to the system, making requests, getting responses. Uh, we've got a web service that we're talking out to, getting responses, but somebody else owns or controls that. So we're gonna, you know, we, we know that that is kind of the boundary of our system. Uh, we've got a database, so we're you know, writing data to that, reading it, and then we've got a you know, some sort of a log facility somewhere that we're writing log entries out to. This is an example, it's a pretty simple data flow diagram um, that, uh, that, that hopefully shows you, here's how you enumerate the different pieces of the system, how they're communicating. Uh, from this, we can then start to identify different threat types, uh, and we use this concept of stride, uh, and this comes out of the Microsoft SDL, the way that they originally did a lot of their threat modeling, um, and stride is essentially an expansion of the common like CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and so with uh, stride, we're looking at spoofing identity, uh, tampering with data, Repudiation, how do they, and which is the process of one trading partner uh, claiming that they did or did not uh, participate in a transaction when they did not or did. Uh, information disclosure, uh, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And what we see is for those different component types for systems, uh, what we see is that the different types can be subject to different types of threats. So for example, if you've got an external interactor, you, 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 may be you, you may be concerned about spoofing, right? How do I know when I'm talking to what I think is this external interactor, how do I know that I'm talking to who I think I'm talking to? Uh, you're not necessarily concerned about tampering with a, an external interactor because that's external to the system, right? If somebody wants to tamper with that, that's not your problem. Uh, it is only insofar as that impacts your system, which again could be spoofing or it could also be repudiation, right? Where that external interactor would say, you know, make an order and then say, well, I know I didn't make that order. Um, you know, processes in your system are subject to all of these potential issues, um, you know, and, and data flows and data stores, again, are subject to a subset of those. Um, and so the, you know, the process of, you know, once you've got your uh, asset uh, description and the data flows surrounding them, enumerating threats is pretty straightforward because you just take all of your assets, you've got a list of assets, uh, you know, for the type of asset, you can associate the threat types of each, each asset and, and, and you know, Voila, like now you have a list of all the things or, or, or a, at least a structured list of the types of things that you need to worry about for this particular system. Um, and again, what I like about threat modeling, especially from a standpoint of uh, you know, supporting assessments of complex systems is it gives you, you know, assuming everybody would draw their data flow diagrams, you know, in reasonably the same way, that's going to give you a very consistent set of threats, um, you know, across different individuals that might go th through the threat modeling process, um, you know, or, you know, across the different systems, you, you can at least feel reasonably comfortable that you have a level of consistency um, of the of getting this list of threats, you know, obviously there's subtlety to it. There's you know the opportunity for you know great brilliance in security, uh, but but th what threat modeling helps uh, us to do in a lot of cases, and we've seen it help other organizations, is kind of standardize uh, so that you know you can you can feel that you have at least a certain level of insight uh, consistently across the systems that you threat model. Um, and so what are your countermeasures? Again, you know, once you've got your list of threats, you know, you have the option to do nothing. Uh, yeah, that's you know, totally fine, right? You may say, well, we're going to accept the risk of that. I remember a threat modeling project that we did with a large financial, uh, and you know, we went, you know, they were doing some really cool stuff, like really cutting edge stuff for their, uh, for, for their customers uh, and, and their stakeholders. And we came into the threat model and they said, we don't care about the risk of fraud, right? Uh, like for this threat modeling purposes, don't worry about fraud in the system, right? Which was crazy for us to hear is, you know, 
like, what, what, what do you mean we don't want to worry about fraud? You know, but in their case, you know, hey, we've got a fraud group. You know, we're we're going to manage that in a separate process. All right. And what we're doing here, we believe, is so valuable for our customers that we are willing to accept that risk. Right. And 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 that was a really interesting conversation uh, you know, for me because what it showed is that this organization was you know as as, as at Denim Group, you know, we can help characterize risk to organizations and give them insight but really the risk management has to be done by that organization right and they were able to say we see this much value we see this much downside we're going to accept the potential for downside because we think we have so much value so that was really for me at least it was very interesting engagement um, because we had you know we, we got to see that risk management in action now, you know what else can you do to address things you can remove the feature you can turn off the feature by default you can warn the user you know, people love to click through warnings <laughs> um, you know you can uh, you know, counter threats with operations, so adding some sort of accountability or separation of duties. Uh, you can counter threats with technologies, you know, change the design, change the implementation. You know, there's not, not one catch-all countermeasure for these different situations. The value of the process is to go through in a structured way to see, you know, to, to get this list of threats and to make explicit decisions on how you're going to address those threats. Um, again, I'm a big fan of being explicit in decision-making about risk as opposed to, you know, accidentally accepting risk because you didn't think uh, you know, particular aspects of systems through. So when you apply threat modeling to IoT systems in particular, uh, what is that, uh, what, what, what's special or what are the things to pay attention to in this, in those uh, you know, IoT environments? And so we've got this example of a consumer uh, IoT threat model, right? We've got uh, you know, the IoT support services, whatever web services do all the server side stuff. Again, maybe you've got a web uh, admin interface that people can use to manage their devices. Maybe there's a mobile client, uh, you know, and then you've got, uh, you know, on the actual IoT device that's running on a user site. Maybe it talks directly to the services. Maybe it talks to some sort of a local gateway, uh, and maybe it's calling out to different third-party services. Um, and so there are a couple of use cases that where, where we see particular challenges working with organizations. Uh, one is the initial provisioning and uh, deployment of the system, right? There's a time where you know, somebody takes this device out of the box, plugs it in to charge the battery or whatever it does, and then it needs to get connected up to the world in some way, right? And so, you know, and that's a kind of a, from a life cycle standpoint, again, that, you know, typically happens once, uh, but it's an area where there are a lot of challenges. How does this thing uh, get an identity as a device? How does it communicate its identity, um, you know, during this provisioning process up to some sort of server side or central resources? And so that's a particular uh, area to, to think about when you're looking at the life cycle of systems that you might be building or deploying. Uh, also, configuration updates, right? Uh, you know, these devices with, with IoT, you know, these devices are running in people's homes, they're wrapped around people's wrists, they're, you know, again, you don't control the environment typically where these devices are going to be deployed, you know, but they're going to be security issues that need to be addressed, they're going to be, you know, bug fixes and other things like that. You know, how do these, uh, you know, how do you communicate configuration updates out to these devices? Uh, especially in situations like, like these enterprise environments, you know, it's one thing to think of the trouble that you might cause a consumer user, you know, standing up a device. Uh, it's, it's certainly another, or, you know, potentially, you know, if you're rolling out like hundreds or thousands of consumer devices into an enterprise environment, how do you manage the configuration of those over time? Uh, another big concern that we see in enterprise environments where they're using consumer technologies is what sort of features and capabilities do these devices have to fit into your enterprise uh, you know authentication authorization right uh, you know it's it's one thing to enter username and password it's another thing to say well that's actually going to bounce up against our enterprise LDAP or, or, or AD server or something like that right uh, so that concept of identity you know hard enough in general for IOT is potentially even more so uh, when looking at consumer devices put into enterprise environments. Uh, and, and again, I talked a little bit about those configuration updates, also with software updates. How do you push security fixes or new changes down? And, and how is that process secured? If I want to subvert a device, I can either you know, do something bad to the device or I can subvert that update process and that may potentially allow me to run my own code on a device. And so uh, with IoT, there are a lot of lifecycle concerns that 
you don't see in, you know, again, enterprise web applications or web services or something like that, where you have a lot more control. Uh, these are particular, these are a couple of use cases where we've identified a lot of potential problems. Um, <clears throat> the Another thing to note about these IoT systems is there. There's a lot of parts uh, and a lot of different pieces in how they talk to one another. You have web apps, web services, you have custom hardware, esoteric protocols, um, and if you want to do testing for these systems, yeah, that can be challenging. You're never going to have the resources you want to be exhaustive, and so threat modeling can help to drive these decisions. Right? I have this much, you know, th this many resources to apply to securing the system. How do I want to focus those to get the best impact? Uh, so, you know, asking a question, hey, you know, should I fuzz test the device at Zigbee stack or run static analysis on the web services, right? And the threat model can help you see, well, hey, you know, if we've got a problem on the consumer device, uh, you know, maybe I, you know, maybe I'm, I've licensed my Zigbee stack that's going on the device. And so hopefully they're doing some stuff, you know, but I control the web services and all this data is concentrated, like all this valuable data is concentrated on the web services. Okay, well, I certainly don't want people to be able to like blow up the Zigbee stack and take over an individual device, you know, but I really, really don't want someone from anywhere in the world to be able to steal all the data that we're collecting about all of our devices, you know, that they can get from these web services. So the threat models can help to focus these uh, testing activities. Another thing that is uh, peculiar to, or, or certain, certainly a greater concern in the world of IoT is one of safety. Um, you know, and so if we think about confidentiality, integrity, and availability, just uh, looking at, at that you know, as opposed to just the stride, in most of the security world, the focus is on, the greatest focus is typically on confidentiality breaches of regulated information. I, I had an interesting conversation with uh, Josh Corman about this, and that was, a, that was a point that he made. You know, if you look at, you know, PCI regulations, HIPAA, things like that, uh, the focus is don't let people steal your credit cards, right, or whatever, uh, whatever. I've got this sensitive data, don't let people steal it. Uh, when we look at IoT, especially industrial environments, that may bring concerns about integrity or availability uh, because that can potentially have an impact on the kinetic environment, right? You know, if we're talking about uh, you know, pacemakers and things like that, <clears throat> well, I, cert I, you know, I wouldn't want my pacemaker to tell someone, here's, you know, here, here's how many beats per minute Dan's heart is going through, right? Or here's a health condition that Dan has, right? I, I would not like that confidentiality breach, but I would far less like for there to be an integrity breach where someone could overwrite the software on the device and make it do what they wanted, right? Or I would very much not like for you to, you know, for an attacker to be able to have an availability impact on my pacemaker, right? Because that then has a safety concern. Uh, and again, these safety concerns, you know, not unique to IoT environments, uh, but certainly that question comes up a lot more. And again, a real challenge with a lot of the thinking for, uh, the practitioners in the security industry is a whole lot of focus and thinking goes into confidentiality of sensitive or regulated information. And although lip service is paid to integrity and especially availability, uh, you know, those are potentially areas that have a uh, uh, need, need a greater scrutiny in a world of IoT. You know, it's uh, funny, uh, you know, it, it used to be that, uh, you know, Stephen King, if you thought, like, who's writing the scariest uh, stuff out there, you know, Stephen King, right, you know, writing the story about the, uh, the you know, the mangler is a story about uh, industrial laundry equipment that gets possessed by black magic, uh, maximum overdrive, uh, you know, it was uh, you know, radiation from, like, a rogue comet makes all the, like, cars and trucks come to life, <laughs> right, so Stephen King used to be writing the scariest stuff out there. You know, I would argue that the scariest stuff being written right now is by interest level programmers working at IOT firms um, you know and, and you know what if we started connecting things like the mangler or trucks to the internet right and, and had the code for this being written by junior level developers um, you know that don't have an understanding of security right and so uh, this is I think a thought process that's really important in an uh, IOT security world that maybe people don't pay attention to otherwise uh, you know and again this is something we have from a medical device standpoint uh, I think uh, an anecdotally when they uh, Vice President Dick Cheney got a, either a pacemaker or an updated pacemaker, and they disabled certain capabilities, um, you know, for for remote updates uh, because, and you know, again, from a, from a threat a risk management standpoint, looking and saying, well, we have at any given time, we have one vice president. It's 
super important not to be able to turn off his pacemaker and the adversaries that, you know, nation state adversaries are potentially ones that have the resources to find that. So uh, that's an interesting article you know, worth taking a look at to understand a little bit about, uh, you know, the kind of the thought process that went into that. Uh, similar looking at things like, uh, uh, you know, insulin pumps and things like that. Uh, again, medical devices really drive home a lot of these concerns about, uh, you know, about, about risk. Um, and uh, I mentioned Josh Corman earlier, he's done a lot of really interesting thinking in this area. Uh, and so here's some links to articles that he's written. Um, you know, and, and also there's some really interesting work and thinking going on right now with the FDA looking at the, um, you know, looking at uh, you know, what, 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 what can the government be doing potentially to help increase security in these really critical areas. Uh, also, some really interesting stuff published by the folks at ARM. Obviously, their components get used in a lot of IoT systems, and so they've actually published um, a, a, a platform security architecture, uh, which is really good because it says, hey, here's a couple different use cases for our stuff, you know, asset tracking, smart water meter, network cameras. Uh, you know, here are typical use cases for our devices. Here is a platform security architecture, or I would argue somewhat of a template threat model for those particular use cases. I love seeing stuff like this from industry where organizations are looking at their products and how they're going to be used farther on in the supply chain uh, and, and proactively providing this type of security guidance. Really good stuff. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, we have some uh, threat modeling materials that we uh, that we published. I've got links to all this. So, uh, you know, all this will be available, and if people are interested, let us know. We may, uh, you know, we may run. You know, since, since everyone's working from home now, uh, you know, we maybe we'll run some lunchtime sessions, uh, you know, on threat modeling just to go deeper into that process. Because again, I think this is really valuable. Uh, so just in closing, uh, you know, IoT systems are really varied and complicated. That's, I mean, which which is great. I mean, that's why they're so cool and interesting. They're letting organizations. Uh, create these capabilities for people that they hadn't had before. Really, really neat. Um, but the flip side of that from a security standpoint is it makes it really challenging. And this is especially important in situations where these devices are increasingly having safety implications. Uh, threat modeling is a really valuable technique both for avoiding introducing vulnerabilities and issues into systems during the build process, uh, but also for structuring your assessments. If you're looking at a system, again, from a supply chain standpoint, before you bring something on board, this is a structured way to look at the potential security implications of bringing those systems on board. And uh, you know what, what it nets out to for us is if you're building uh, IoT systems or if you're considering deploying significant IoT systems into your environment, you can save a lot of headaches. You can get out in front of a lot of challenges um, uh, you know, by using threat modeling as a technique. It's something that we've found to be really, really valuable. Uh, okay, I'll go to a couple of questions here. Uh, okay, so one, one question is, will the slides be available after the webinar? Yes, uh, Carrie will get those published up, uh, both the recording and the slides, uh, so that those will be available. Uh, and uh, those should go out to emails. Uh, and also the recording, uh, again, if you found this so fascinating, you feel like you need to watch it again, <laughs> it'll be available. Uh, but if you have you know, coworkers or colleagues, uh, other people that may be interested in this, the recording will be available as well. So we'll get that information mailed out to everybody. Um, Let's see. Uh, also looking at, yeah, and so uh, a qu question about uh, impact of 5G on IoT, uh, you know, connectivity and security. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not a 5G expert. We've got other folks uh, on, in our organization that are a lot deeper into that, but I think that from an architecture standpoint with 5G, like number one, just the like speed and pervasiveness of it is going to open up new and novel applications uh, that is that are really going to make you know, it possible to do new things in IoT uh, or with IoT that couldn't be done before. And, and, and I think that's awesome, right? I mean, you know, just, the, and I love being in the security industry and looking at technologies and the evolution. You know, I felt that way with the web at the beginning of my career, you know, as we started doing a lot of work with mobile security after that, as we've now gotten into IoT security, um, it's just really incredible to see the cool stuff that we can build, uh, you know, as, as, Technologists or as humans, you know, the cool stuff that we can build, and each of these new kind of, you know, architectures, you know, the connectivity and speed of 5G, uh, you know, lets us build new and interesting stuff that really allows for just uh, you know, cooler, you know, pushing the bounds uh, of, of human potential. Really exciting stuff. Uh, again, the flip side is, what about the security implications? And what we see from a 5G standpoint, you know, architecturally, again, with you know, pushing things out, a lot of caching. Um, 
you know, I think that that is, you know, just as it open up, opens up new avenues for new classes of applications because of the increased speed and the pervasiveness, um, the architecture and the caching uh, also creates a lot of concerns. Uh, and especially when you look from a supply chain standpoint, you know, there's a lot of concerns of, uh, you know, you know, sourcing from different, uh, you know, different entities, you know, foreign entities and things like that. Um, just from an adversary standpoint, uh, you know, it opens up a lot of questions, you know, none of which have really easy, uh, you know, really easy answers. Uh, got another question here. Um, looking at, uh, you know, you're teaching developers about threat modeling. Yeah, so I think that, um, I think that it is easy is maybe the wrong way to characterize, characterize it, but I think that all developers can be taught in a reasonably uh, efficient manner to do some level of threat modeling. And, and if you saw as we went through the process, again, it's you know, make my data flow diagram. Those are hopefully pretty consistent. Uh, you know, use stride and the threats to enumerate things like that. That's uh, a technique that can be fairly easy to teach. Um, it, it more so, I would argue, than like, uh, you know, pen testing or web hacking or things like that, where I think you know, certain developers are really good at it, take to it, or very interested in it. You know, obviously you can teach people, you know, kind of some some basic techniques to go through. Uh, but I think threat modeling is something just you know for developers that are used to building distributed systems. I think threat modeling is just layering on a little bit of an additional perspective and thought process. Um, and so it's something that developers certainly can be taught to do this. And and I think that's a great way to. Uh, I, I would I would argue that as a better way more broadly to get developers interested in security uh, versus trying to teach them web hacking or something like that, uh, which I think, you know, is, is, is certainly possible for everyone to do. Um, but in my experience, certain developers have an interest or an aptitude in that type of technical testing uh, that, that because of that interest and aptitude makes them uh, you know, be better at it. Uh, you know, versus threat modeling that I think can be, uh, again, just kind of layered on top of the distributed systems design, uh, you know, thinking that these developers have. Uh, excellent. Well, good. Well, I wanted to thank everyone for coming out today. Um, and, and again, if, uh, if, th if this is valuable, uh, please let us know if there's other topics that you'd like us to talk about. Um, so thank you everybody for taking some time, spending some time with us. We'll get the slides and the video posted here shortly. Um, and uh, you know, just in closing, you know, it's a cr it's a crazy world right now. Uh, but everybody stay healthy and safe out there. And uh, I'll see you all on the other side. Thanks a bunch.